There is no doubt Final Fantasy has a rich history spanning almost 35 years. And slowly, very slowly, I venture to cover the numbered series up until either I get bored of it, run out of games to cover, or die. Yeah, I'm betting on the latter. Originally the plan was just to cover the Roman numerals and not any of the spin-offs, but this one I feel deserves a spot in the timeline just for its sheer historical significance. As reiterated ad nauseum in my Final Fantasy series, there was a profound release discrepancy when it came to us weebs in the States. From giving us Final Fantasy IV and calling it Final Fantasy II, to the outright lack of the original Final Fantasy II and III, it's been theorized that these weird localization discrepancies were the result of Square trying to save money in some way or another. Meaning, exporting the games to the US was not a lucrative venture at the time. This fascinating history of RPGs from Japan seemed to have accumulated and resulted in the game I'm here to talk about today. Final Fantasy Mystic Quest, it's claimed, was a direct result of these money-saving measures by Square and Nintendo, as it's an RPG made specifically for the US. Because of this, the goal seemed to not be making a game with an engaging story or to revolutionize the basic mechanics in some way. Now instead, everything was dumbed down and streamlined in an effort to introduce the US to the concept of RPGs. <laughs> yes, Square, please teach us dumb Americans, the cryptic and enigmatic art of the role-playing game. Look, I'm not saying this was a bad idea on Square's part per se. I'm sure the numbers told a different story back then, and the genre really did only seem to attract a small niche in the US. But my problem is it seems like a wasted effort in retrospect. Fall Fantasy VI, Earthbound, Breath of Fire, Super Mario RPG, Lufia, all games that easily withstood the test of time and solidified the role-playing genre as a staple of the video game industry. In comparison, what is Mystic Quest supposed to be then? Well, it was good enough to have its own Japanese release a year later titled, and I kid you not, Final Fantasy USA Mystic Quest. But to me, it comes off as a bit too coddling, both in concept and execution. But first, let's roll up our sleeves and get down to the nitty gritty. The game starts by whiplashing you into the story. The screen shakes, you're suddenly on the hill of destiny talking to an old dude flying on a cloud who tells you how to jump across the gap. Meanwhile the music is going fucking nuts and then you're shown the focus tower and told that a prophecy said that four monsters will take the keys to the four doors of the focus tower then there's crystals of light being drained, the world is in chaos and you must be the chosen one for reasons. When I decided for true immersion's sake, this will be the origins of Sir Dudenheim, you know, before he was knighted and became a proper adventurer. So at this point, he's just known as Duder. Or his Dudeness, if you're into that whole brevity thing. So Duder is tasked with finding the four monsters who have the four crystals and prevent the apocalypse or some shit. The game is so streamlined, they might as well have left the entire story up to the player's imagination. Case in point, the world map. You can't even move freely. You have to go the directions the game points you to. The option of exploration is one of the first casualties you experience in this game, and it's still both sad and hilarious to me. Not as sad and hilarious as the first place you stop at, though, which is literally called Level Forest. <laughs> Boy, can't wait to visit Grinding Swamp and Mount Fetch Quest. Duder is told by the mysterious old Cloud Man that his first task is to get the Crystal of Earth, and then pieces out. Well, the only place we can go is this other old man who tells us to meet Kaylee in the town of Foresta. Whoa, whoa, slow down, game. <laughs> Jeez, you're giving me too much information at once here. Kaylee is actually our first party member in this game. You only get one at a time, and they're automatically set to fight. Uh, automatically. You can switch them to manual, but you know what? I'm really starting to get into this lazy standard Square set up for me. <laughs> if they're not even going to let me explore the world map, then why bother control two characters, right? 
Little did I know that, in later parts of the game, having your companion set to automatic is the equivalent of hard mode. Anyway, back to Kaylee, and back to level forest, we learn of a neat mechanic unique only to Mystic Quest. You get four different weapon types to switch from throughout the game, and each one serves a unique purpose when exploring dungeons. So with Kaylee's axe, we're allowed to chop down trees with reckless abandon. Interesting choice to have your first teammate be a axe-wielding woman in a dress. Later we get claws, which evolve into a hook shot, and bombs. It's a fun little way to give dungeon exploration a added puzzle element. Not that any of said puzzles will keep you up at night or anything like that. Duder's only other obstacle in these dungeon areas are of course the monsters. But you can't just have random encounters like in most every other RPG. <laughs> no, we Americans can't stand that kind of shit. So Mystic Quest solved the issue by having all the monsters just sit still in plain view until you bravely rub your forehead into them. Honestly, this doesn't seem so bad at first, knowing what you're up against and, in some cases, directly avoiding unnecessary extra encounters. But personally, there were times when being able to see all the encounters I had to deal with ahead of time was more exhausting than if they were just random and I would have potentially encountered less. As for the fights themselves... The first thing I'm sure anyone noticed when playing this game is the health bar. That's right, Square thought we were afraid of numbers and put a tally system in the game instead. Now sure, there is an option to switch it to number mode, but again, the laziness is just so infectious, I love it. Plus there's nothing wrong with a tally health system, just look at Metroid. We didn't think that game treated us like babies. But that's just the health. What about the rest of the combat in this game? Well, it's pretty standard, as you'd think it would be. But that, too, isn't necessarily a bad thing. It's actually really reminiscent of Final Fantasy 1 in its simplicity, which I think just goes to show how bare-bones the original game was. But they did put something in the fights that I find to be an improvement to other RPGs, and I'm sad it wasn't implemented more. And that's the enemy battle damage. Whenever a monster is near defeat, their sprite changes to signify it, and I always thought it was super cool. It single-handedly made a simple RPG battle system instantly more entertaining, and a lot of them are pretty goofy looking too. My favorite is the Desert Hag. And bosses always have more than two stages, so you get to watch as you progressively will them down to nothing. Again, probably the coolest thing to come out of this game. Back to the story, Kaylee gets poisoned by a minotaur and needs an elixir to be cured. So we have to go to the only place that apparently has elixirs, the Sand Temple. Okay, see, this still is Final Fantasy at the heart of it all. Getting elixirs to save fallen maidens and such. But then, the next stop on the world map is a battlefield. These, in my opinion, really solidify the lack of nuance this game has. As battlefields are optional areas where you can battle sets of 10 enemies. I assume just for the sake of grinding, since the rewards for clearing all 10 fights is hardly ever worth it. So you'd think making an RPG more accessible to people would have grinding be completely removed and not even an option. But no, they even make that its own little simplified baby's first version. Maybe it makes the game harder not to do these, but again, that would incentivize grinding as important, and I thought we were trying to bring more people into the role-playing game scene, not scare them off. Anyway, the Sand Temple doesn't have any dang elixir, and Davy Crockett here shows up and offers to sell us one, leading to the baffling reveal that our hero has an allowance. So the guy instead asks us to escort him through Bone Dungeon to get a treasure. Uh, is this guy coming on to Duder? Oh, Bone Dungeon is a place. And what luck! Bone Dungeon's boss has the Earth Crystal. <laughs> That's funny. That was our number one priority to begin with, but Duder ended up getting distracted by other piddly tasks, and found it anyway by mistake. <laughs> distracted by a woman in need, no less. Yep, that's Duder, all right. Another thing I do appreciate about this game is when recovering the crystals, the main town for that continent actually changes to show the effect the crystal being gone had. So for Foresta, which was all brown and gross looking, it's now all green, and less gross looking. Same goes for Aquaria. 
It's been entirely frozen over, and a mage named Phoebe has been trying to fix it. Well, we needed the Earth Crystal to fix Foresta. I wonder what crystal we need to fix Aquaria. Hmm... Maybe the floating old man knows. Duder and his new fucking lady friend go through a crystal pyramid, solve some weapon-based puzzles, even a jumping puzzle, melt an ice golem, and... Oh, it was the water crystal this whole time. And now the town isn't frozen anymore. Right, so next it's off to Flameville, yeah? I kid, but I'm actually not that far off. It's Fireberg. <laughs> Gee, I wonder what crystal I'll need. All right, I'm done. This one's actually the lamest because their problem is continuous earthquakes, so solving it won't change any of the town's aesthetics. It makes up for it with some rock and music, though. Hey, and Davy Crockett's here. Okay, good talk. Instead, we get a dude named Reuben who needs to help his dad Indiana Jones with a giant boulder. Then it's off to a volcano where parts of the dungeon are hazy and makes the static enemies invisible. Not that that matters because they're still placed in spots where you have to encounter them to proceed. But wouldn't you know it, the volcano boss had the fire crystal. Alright, maybe I'm skipping ahead too fast. The Medusa mini boss here did give me a hard time because at this point all my potions and heals became limited. And Reuben can't do dick magic wise, so it became a battle of attrition. And by battle of attrition, I mean I restarted the fight over and over until it went in my favor. Remember, this is Mystic Quest we're talking about. Death doesn't take you back to your last save. You're just asked if you want to restart the entire fight again from scratch. No health penalties, all the items and spell charges you used go back to what they were before the fight. Again, I could kind of get behind some of the laziness this game enforces. Certainly makes beating the game for footage a breeze. So Dragon's dead, Earthquake stopped, moving on. On our way to the final town, Reuben falls off a bridge and Davy Crockett shows up just in time to fill the empty slot. Jesus man, Reuben's body's still warm. Because he isn't dead. This doesn't last long though as we come across a tree with a face and somehow put together that Kaylee's the one we need to talk to him. Oh boy, backtracking! Well, at least Davy lends us his trusty hookshot. Speaking of, once we finally get the tree talking, he asks us to enter inside him and fight off the monsters. Oh, let me just put on some more appropriate music. This is where the fights can start to get tricky, as more and more enemies begin using status effect spells like Petrify and Paralyze. These usually aren't bad in RPGs, but here it can be deadly, as you only have two characters and losing the ability of one can make things hard to manage. Especially if you have the guest member on auto and they waste their turn healing status effects. You can literally get stuck in a perpetual loop of the enemy stunlocking you and it's annoying as hell when you just want to fucking end the fight already. God damn! Would it have killed him to make status effects a percentage based system instead of an automatic guarantee to work? You know, like all other games? Even the Chimera boss inside the tree can stun and petrify. Just let me win already! But with it dead, the great Deku tree is so thankful that he walks us across the woods himself. We have agreed. You are not hooks. The village in this section is called Windia, and again, they must have run out of ideas, because their big issue is the wind blowing hard, hence the noise. Well, I don't know what else you people expected when you called this town Windia. In the town, we meet a science guy named Otto, who has a machine that can build a rainbow road to a tower in the north. Because of the bad winds, the machine broke while his daughter was on the other side of it in a place full of monsters. I guess she likes to play there in her spare time or something. In order to save her, we need to stop the crazy winds from blowing out of Mount Gale. Again, with the naming, it's almost like wind is a typical problem for these people. To stop the winds, we fight the boss on top of the mountain that looks like that. 
The hell is that thing? An egg with legs? Oh, it's supposed to be the headless horse. Man, that looks weird. So the knight turns out to not be the one with the crystal, but was the one causing the wind problems. Somehow. So after a trip down Rainbow Road, we enter the North Tower and fight Pazuzu. And boy is his fight annoying. The guy hits like a truck and can block against magic, which I have been using more on bosses because Duder apparently has the power to cast Flare. The problem I keep running into though is that Kaylee keeps dying on me. Duder doesn't have a life spell, and as far as I can tell, Phoenix Downs don't exist in this game. And with her down, Pazuzu can easily end the fight by casting Petrify on Duder. <sighs> See, it's parts like this that make the whole lack of grinding thing actually annoying. In any other game, I would take this opportunity to look at what my party has at its disposal, and if changing tactics around isn't cutting it, go out and level up my characters. But in this game, there aren't any tactics to be changed around, and I did all the grinding the game set up for me. Also, no Phoenix Downs? In a Final Fantasy game that didn't even bother to keep looted chests permanently empty? But once again, it's good old fashioned perseverance that comes in to save the day, and the final crystal is secure. So that's it. The game's won, right? Even a lady in Windia says the world is saved. Maybe Square was worried game over credits were too complex for Americans too. Now our next task is to save Captain Mac. Throughout the game, people have been talking about this fucking guy whose ship's been stuck in a dried up lake. So Reuben jumps into the party and we have this pointless detour where we go back to Fireburg to talk to Indiana Jones for a Thunderstone and we bring it back to Dr. Wily here so he can update the Rainbow Road so we can blow up a cave unleashing the water and sending Captain Mac's ship into another island where we have to find our way to which is by going on a teleporter hidden in a random house on Windia. Oh yeah, and the ship itself is a dungeon. Man, Pazuzu's tower and now this ship? These dungeons have definitely become harder and less linear as the game's carried on, but this is topping even the most difficult dungeons in the numerical series at this point. That, or in the short time I've been playing this game, I really have become accustomed to its laziness. I wouldn't be surprised. I'm a lazy person by nature. Captain Mac is saved, and thank god there's no boss. He has news on the prophecy and how the Four Crystals' disappearances were conducted by an ultimate evil known as the Dark King. Well, isn't that just always the way? But with his ship, we can now enter the bottom of Focus Tower and face him. At the apex of the tower, the four crystals come together and bestow upon Duder and Co. gifts, like heals, potions, and arrows. Gee, what bounty? Then it's off to an admittedly creepy area where the final fight commences. Unfortunately, the Dark King doesn't have any special fighting style or clever way to be defeated. All that makes him special is that he knows cure and elemental magic, and uses them every now and then. Now, actually what's unique about him is that instead of slowly falling apart as damage is dealt, he metamorphs into a spider monster. Once again, Perseverance saves the day, and in this case, also the world. The floating old guy who'd been offering us some top-notch comic relief throughout the game shows up and reveals he's actually the Crystal of Light. You know, that thing that we didn't even know existed for the entirety of the game. Anyway, he has some sappy speech about hope and courage and creating a brighter future bullshit. You know, it would have been a better victory speech. Hey everybody, we're all gonna get late! <laughs> 
The story closes with Duder being given Captain Mac's ship and is waved off by all the people he met along the way, as he sails off into the Great Blue Yonder. No doubt picking up three other weirdos as he journeys, getting shipwrecked onto another strange land, and getting tangled into another stupid prophecy. But that's a story for another game. Final Fantasy Mystic Quest is certainly a fascinating beast, and one I can see wanting to play if you're a fan of the Final Fantasy series and want to see what a game can be like when stripped of any nuance and flashiness. The gameplay may be dirt simple, but the graphics are still a lot of fun, even though they dive into RPG Maker territory at times. And the story is silly and uninspired, but maybe an epic tale isn't what you're looking for. Even though, if that's the case, then why the hell did you decide to play an RPG? See, when it comes to Mystic Quest, I can understand and appreciate what it is, but at the same time, that always comes with some form of criticism. I like the weakened monster sprites, but you have to endure a boring combat system to see it. Grinding isn't necessary, but instead of grinding, they put battle zones as a dull replacement with little to no incentive to clear them. And I did clear them all, by the way, meaning throughout the game I should have been the level the game would expect me to be. But all the times I died in a fight seemed to have less to do with how powerful I was and more to do with how unlucky I just happened to be. So it's not like grinding should even be a thing in this game in the first place. And what about this game feels like Final Fantasy? Nothing, as far as I can tell. There's a reference to chocobos at one point, but there's no moogles, no summons, no airships. This game doesn't even have a Sid. Who the fuck is Captain Mac? This game has less to do with Final Fantasy than that fucking Spirits Within movie. They don't even have the arpeggio. The music in this game isn't bad. It isn't grating, at least. But, I don't know. Personally, it doesn't feel very Final Fantasy either. Other than maybe the village music, it's too bombastic at times and too 16-bit electric guitar. All I'm saying is, this game would have worked as literally anything other than a Final Fantasy installment. And that's probably why I have a hard time accepting it for what it is. Regardless of why Square made it in the first place. But that's okay, because obviously, Square hasn't given up on us Yankee Doodles just yet. There's more to come, I just feel this game deserved to look back on, since it exists in our memories, much the same way Final Fantasy 4 and 6 do. No, oh, sorry, 2 and 3. With that being said, despite the effort put out by Square, this game clearly didn't help with American ports, as the next one can attest to.